The origin section of your Sprite Properties window defaults to an X of 0 and a Y value of 0. This means that the origin point of your sprite is at the very top left of your sprite. You can make these numbers literally equal anything you want. Usually, you want your origin to be the very top left of your image or the center of your image. The origin is used as a reference point for other sections in GameMaker, particularly your objects and your rooms. For example, if you told your object to rotate, your object would rotate around your origin. If your origin is at the top left, your image will rotate around the top left of itself. That might look strange. Most of the time you'll want to center your origin, so if you rotated your object or flipped it in some way, it would rotate right at the center of your image or flip it evenly. I'll show you more about origins when we get into objects and rooms. At the top of the sprite editor window, you'll see drop-down menus. Below that, you'll have a toolbar. On the left side, you'll have the preview window. If you have Show Preview selected, you'll see a preview of the animation, if you have more than one sub-image. The big area on the right will house all of your sub-images. And at the very bottom, you'll find your info bar. This will give you the information about how many frames are currently in your animation. Frames are also known as sub-images. Next to that, you'll find your size. This is the size of your canvas, your width and height in pixels. Then you'll find the memory. This is how much space this animation will take up in texture memory. Okay, let's go through each of the drop-down menus. If you drop down File, you'll find New, Hotkey Control N. If you click that, you'll get a Create a New Sprite window. It'll ask you for your width and height in pixels, and when you click OK, you'll get a new sub-image. Beware though, this will delete all of your current sub-images in your animation. It's like starting from scratch. The next item is Create from File, or Control O. This is similar to what we did when we clicked on Load Sprite back in the Sprite Properties window. However, just like when creating a new sprite, this will overwrite and delete all of your current sub-images. So beware, it's like starting from scratch. If you don't want to start from scratch, the next option is Add from File. If you select that, you'll be greeted with an Explorer window again. Any sprites added this way will add to your current animation, adding new sub-images. The next option is Save as PNG File. It's Control S for the hotkey. This selection will save out your entire animation as one PNG file. This could be important to use if you wish to edit your sprites in a different sprite editor, or if you need to send your sprites to other artists. I'm going to skip the next two. The very last option is Close Saving Changes. This will close the window and save any changes you've made to your sprite. Going back up, we'll find Create from Strip and Add from Strip, Control i and Control p Before we click on either of them, I'd like you to note that Create from Strip will overwrite any sub-images you currently have, and Add from Strip will add to the current sub-images you have. Let's click on Create from Strip. Once again, you'll be greeted with an Explorer window. What GameMaker Studio is looking for is one image file that contains many different sprites in one animation strip. If you were to click on any image file and then click Open, the Explorer window will go away and now you'll see Loading a Strip Image. You have a lot of options here. The first option is Number of Images. GameMaker Studio wants to know how many images you want to import. Next, images per row. It's pretty self-explanatory. How many images are in each row? Image width and image height is looking for how wide and how tall each image is in pixels. This width and height will make up the size of one cell. Horizontal cell offset and vertical cell offset determine how far into your sprite sheet the cell should start. Horizontal pixel offset and vertical pixel offset will determine where the first cell starts on your image in pixels. Horizontal separation and vertical separation determine how far apart each cell is in pixels. Once you click on OK, you'll be brought back to the Sprite Editor window. And if everything was done properly, you'll see your animation laid out. In the Edit drop-down menu, you'll find options such as Undo, Control z Redo, Shift-Ctrl-Z, Cut, Copy, and Paste, 
which are pretty standard for most programs, you'll find Erase and Delete. These are slightly different from each other. Erase will erase one or all images to a particular color. When you click on it, you'll get a window called Erase to a Color. From here, you can select the color you wish to erase to, and the opacity, also known as alpha. We'll get into alpha channels later. Then you can decide whether you want to apply it to all images in the sprite or just one. Delete will just delete the currently selected sub-image. Move left and move right will move the currently selected sub-image one frame left or right in the animation sequence. Add empty will add an empty sub-image at the very end of your animation sequence. Insert empty will insert an empty frame just before the currently selected sub-image. Edit will open up the image editor window for the currently selected sub-image. This can also be achieved by double-clicking on one of your sub-images. The very last option is Set Transparency Background. I covered this in an earlier lesson. In the Transform drop-down menu, you'll find the option for Shift. This allows you to shift the currently selected sub-image, or all the sub-images, in a direction, up, down, left, or right. You can choose whether to wrap horizontally or vertically. This is whether or not your image should repeat when it goes off of the canvas. The next option is Mirror or Flip. Quite simply, this will flip your sub-image, or all of your sub-images. Rotate allows you to rotate one or all sub-images. The rotation is done in degrees. There are preset buttons for 90, 180, and 270. Scale allows you to change the size of one or all sub-images. This is done by using a percentage. There are quick select buttons for Have and Double, and you can decide whether you want to do it horizontally, vertically, or in both directions. Skew allows you to distort your image horizontally and vertically. Here you can play around with the sliders until you achieve the desired effect. This can also be done to one or all of your sub-images. The next section in Transform deals with Resize Canvas. This allows you to change the canvas size of all of your sub-images. You can do it by percentage or by pixels. If you have Keep Aspect Ratio checked, changing just the width or just the height will change the other option and vice versa. It'll keep the aspect ratio. You can also tell the resize window to maintain origin. The Position section allows you to tell GameMaker the point in which you are expanding from or shrinking to. Resize Canvas may only change the canvas size without touching your image. That's why the next section is called Stretch. Inside the Stretch Images window, it's very similar to resizing the canvas. However, this time you're changing the size of your sprite and keeping the canvas size the way it is. You'll notice that the top section looks very similar to Resize Canvas. However, the bottom section has a box called Quality. This determines how pixel perfect your stretch will be. In other words, it sets your interpolation level. We'll talk about interpolation later. The last option in the Transform menu is Crop. This allows you to change the border around your image. You can either expand it to add more transparency, or enter a negative number to shrink your border. You can play around with positive and negative numbers here to see its effect. In the Images drop-down, you'll find Cycle Left and Cycle Right. These two options allow you to move all of your sub-images one placement left or one placement right, changing their position in the animation sequence. The next option is Black and White. This simply makes one or all of your sub-images a grayscaled image. The next option is Colorize. In the Colorize the Image window, on the left you'll see your original sub-image, and on the right what it will look like after the effect. Sliding the hue slider left and right will apply sort of an overlay of a single color on top of your sub-image. However, if you check the Shift the Hue box, you'll notice that you're shifting the hue of each individual color inside your sub-image. Once again, you can apply this to one sub-image or all of the sub-images. The next option is Colorize Partial. This is similar to Colorize, except you can isolate one single color inside of your sub-image. The new Hue slider is similar to the Hue slider in Colorize. The old Hue slider is the color you would like to isolate inside your sub-image. The Tolerance slider determines how wide the range is around your old hue. A Tolerance of 0 will select one color. The more you increase the Tolerance slider, the more the colorized partial will select like colors. In other words, hues that are similar to the color you have selected in old hue. Once again, you can also check shift the hue. 
and then you can apply this to one sub image or each individual sub image. The next option is intensity. This has two sliders, value and saturation. Value is similar to luminosity, kind of like a brightness, and saturation is the amount of color that comes through in your sub image. You can play around with these sliders to see what it does to your sub images. The next option is invert. This will simply invert the colors of one or all of your sub images. The next section starts with the option Make Opaque. This option will simply fill in any non-opaque, otherwise known as transparent, sections of your sub-image with a color, typically black. The next option is Erase a Color. I find this option kind of cool. On the left side, in the original window, you can use the eyedropper tool to select a color inside of your image. This will remove that color from your image, which you'll see in the new window on the right side. Then you can use the Tolerance slider to tell GameMaker if you want to remove related colors to the color you have selected. The Tolerance slider determines how close or how far related the color is. Play around with the slider to see what I mean. The next option is Smooth Edge. This simply adds kind of a feather effect to your image, wherever it borders a transparency. The next option is Opacity. You can use the slider to make your image more or less visible. This is known as Opacity or Alpha. If you have Relative selected, this will change the opacity of your current sub-image and add or subtract the opacity number from the current opacity of your image. If you deselect Relative, the Opacity slider will set your transparency at the number you're currently selecting. What this means is a value of 0 will make your sub-image completely invisible and a value of 255 will make your image completely visible regardless of how visible or invisible your sub-image was beforehand. The next option is Set Alpha from File. This is a little complex, and we'll go into more detail in a video I have about color. The next option is called Fade. In the Fade to a Color window, you select a color, and then you decide how transparent that color is overlaid on top of your sub-image. If the amount is zero, that color is not overlaid on top of your sub-image at all. And if the value is 255, that color completely overlays your original sub-image. The next option is Blur. There aren't a lot of options here. You decide whether you want a small, medium, or large blur. Then you decide whether or not the blur will affect your colors, or your transparency, or both. The next option is Sharpen. Similar to Blur, but the opposite. You can decide whether it's subtle, strong, or special. And then decide whether you want it to sharpen colors, sharpen transparency, or both. The last section of images starts with the option Outline. Inside the Outline window, you pick a color that you want to stroke around the edging of your sprite. Then you decide the thickness of this outline or stroke. You can decide whether the stroke is inside the image or outside the image, whether or not you want your original image to be visible or not, and then how smooth or feathered the outline will be. The next option is Shadow. Here you can select the color of the shadow you wish to have, how transparent the shadow is, and then how far away it is from your original image. You can also decide whether or not you want a precise pixel shadow or a soft shadow. That's whether it's sharpened or blurred. The next option is Glow. It's kind of like the shadow option. You select a color, then you select the opacity of that color, and then you select how thick that glow will be. You can also decide whether it's inside or outside the image. That will give you an inner glow or an outer glow. The next option is Button Eyes. This option bevels the canvas of your object. Unfortunately, it can't bevel the edges of your sprite where they touch the transparent section or alpha channel of your image. But if you're making a square image, it works perfectly. You can select your color, that's sort of the color of the light and shadow of this bevel. You can select the opacity, which is how visible this bevel is, and you can select how thick the bevel is, which is how far it goes into your image. You can also smooth the edges to give it a more fine detailed bevel. The last option is Gradient Fill. A gradient is when two or more colors blend together over a distance. Here you can only select two colors. You're going from color 1 to color 2. GameMaker has some pre-built gradients for you to use. It has a left to right, a pipe effect, a top to bottom, a horizontal pipe effect, two diagonals with color one being in the middle, a radial, a diamond look, and then four curved options. You can decide whether this gradient will completely replace the color 
of your sub-image or whether or not it overlays your sub-image by selecting the Replace checkbox. Then you can decide whether this changes the transparency or not. The first option in the animation dropdown is Set Length. This option sets the amount of sub-images in your animation sequence. If you already have an animation, GameMaker will duplicate your current animation sequence until it equals the amount of frames, or decreases to the amount of frames. The next option known as Stretch somewhat changes the speed of your animation. If you add more frames than the amount of frames you already have, your animation will be slower, because it takes more time to animate. If you choose less frames than the amount of frames you currently have, your animation will be faster. These two options work best when you already have an animation. The next two options are Reverse and Add Reverse. Reverse will simply reverse your animation, playing it backwards. The next one is Add Reverse. Add Reverse will take all of your sub-images, duplicate them at the end of your animation sequence, and then reverse those new ones it just added. Now your animation will play forwards and then backwards. However, your first and middle frame will now have a duplicate. You may have to delete this to keep your animation smooth. The next option is Translation Sequence. This allows you to take your sub-image and slide it either up, down, left, or right, and then set the amount of frames it takes to do such animation. Rotation Sequence has a sub-menu. You can decide whether you want to rotate your sub-image clockwise or counterclockwise. Then you decide how many frames it'll take to animate and how many degrees it'll rotate. Play around with this, you'll get some cool results. The next option is Colorize. If you remember Colorize from Image, that only changed your sub-image a single time. This time, you're going to animate your Colorize. Like the Colorize under the Images menu, you change your hue and set whether it's shifting it or not. Then you select how many frames it takes to get to that hue. It's great for creating flashing objects. The next option is Fade to Color. Here you select a color you want your sub-image to fade to, and then how many frames it takes to do so. Over that many frames, your sub-image will fade to a flat version of that color. Disappear simply makes your sub-image fade away. Just type in how many frames you want it to take. You can use this in conjunction with Add Reverse to have your image fade in and out of existence. The next option is Shrink. This will scale down the size of your sub-image, either to the center of the canvas, to the left, right, top, or bottom. Then you tell GameMaker how many frames it should take. Similarly, Grow will do the same thing, except your image will scale up. Flatten will squish your sub-image either to the left, right, top, or bottom of your canvas, and Raise will do the opposite. The last two options are Overlay and Morph. Overlay will open up an Explorer window and ask you to find an image in which to overlay on top of your current sub-image, and then it will ask you how many frames the animation should take. The last option is Morph. Morph is kind of my favorite. Once again, it'll open up an Explorer window. You'll select an image, and then tell GameMaker how many frames it should take to morph from your sub-image to this newly selected image. The toolbar is really simple to understand. The first option is the check mark. It simply closes the window and saves all of your current work from the sprite editor. Then you have some shortcut icons for create a new sprite, create a sprite from file, add a sprite from file, save the sprite as a PNG file, insert an empty image before the current one, add an empty image at the end of your animation sequence, undo, redo, cut, copy, paste, move the current image left, move the current image right, edit the image, similar to double clicking, and the very last option is Pre-Multiply Alpha. On the left side, if you have Show Preview checked, you can watch your animation play out. You can change the speed of the animation at the bottom. This is only the preview speed and not how fast it'll actually animate in your game. However, understanding why the speed is 30 is important, and we'll talk about it later when we talk about rooms. Then you can select the background color that'll appear where the transparency is in your sub-images, or you can select a background from your background resources. Then you can determine whether or not you want to stretch that background. When two sprite masks or collision masks overlap, this is considered a collision. Then you can take this opportunity in your code to do something when two things collide. For example, they could bounce off of each other, one could blow up, 
They could both die. It just depends on what you want to do. But what you have to understand is, for two sprites to collide, their collision masks must overlap. In your sprite's property window, there's a panel on the right called Collision Checking. There's a checkbox for precise collision checking. If you check this, GameMaker will do collisions pixel by pixel. This is very intensive for the player's computer, so it's unwise to set all of your sprites to precise collision checking. Besides, most of the time you'll do fine with a box or a circle. If you have checked the box for precise collision checking, you now have the opportunity to use the checkbox for separate collision masks. This means that each sub-image or frame for your sprite can have a different collision mask. But once again, this is a lot more work for a computer to do. Below those two checkboxes, you'll find a button for Modify Mask. If you click on it, you'll get another window for mask properties for the sprite that you're working with. In the first panel, called Image, we have the width and height of your sprite. Then we have the number of sub-images. If you have more than one sub-image, you can actually use these arrow keys to click between them. Below that, we have Show Collision Mask. Turning it on and off will display the collision mask on the right side. If it's off, you won't see it, and if it's on, you'll get sort of a 50% opacity blackness. Below that, you have some magnifying glasses. You can click these to zoom in and out and reset the view for your sprite on the right side. This is the only way to zoom in and out. Unfortunately, you cannot use your scroll wheel. To the right of image, you'll find a panel for bounding box. The first radio button is automatic. With automatic selected, GameMaker will automatically choose what it thinks is the best bounding box for your sprite. Below that, you have full image. This will just make the entire canvas your collision mask. The third option is manual. This will unlock the four text fields below. From here, you can shrink and expand your collision mask or bounding box in pixels. Remember that the top left corner is 0 for X and 0 for Y. Below bounding box, we have shape. The first option is precise. As I mentioned earlier, this means that your collision mask will be pixel perfect. Below that, we have rectangle. This just creates a four-sided collision mask. Remember, you can always change the size of this mask with those four fields above shape. The next option is ellipse. This will create a circular collision mask. And below that is diamond. This will once again create a four-sided collision mask, but at a 45 degree angle. A lot of sprites in your game won't need precise collision checking. Therefore, rectangle and ellipse are usually suitable. If you do select precise, on the left side of the shape panel, you'll have a general panel. The checkbox titled Separate Collision Masks will allow you to have a different collision mask for each sub-image in this frame. Remembering though that this will be a little more intensive for your game to process. And below that we have an alpha tolerance slider. This is actually really interesting. If your sprite has any transparency to it, you can set a tolerance. What this means is any alpha value that is lower then the alpha tolerance value will not be included in your precise collision mask. This is good for things like glows. Let's say you had a circle or a box that had some sort of faded glow. Well, it probably wouldn't be good to collide with the glow because that's not actually the object. So you could set your slider for alpha tolerance to be higher than the alpha value for that glow. Then nothing will collide with your glow. Almost every game you make in GameMaker will require some sort of collision. So this is very important to understand, and we'll get more into collisions when we talk about coding for collisions. But for now I hope you have a basic understanding of how collision masks work.